Hello and welcome to this video tour of the Whipple Museum of the History of Science. Uh, we're filming this for the Alumni Festival and Open Cambridge 2020 because obviously the in-person tours that I would have been leading have unfortunately been cancelled. Uh, what we're going to focus on today is the special exhibition that we have here in the museum. We opened this exhibition in October of 2019 to celebrate our 75th anniversary. The museum was founded in November of 1944 and to celebrate that we put on an exhibition of the founding donation that established this museum and that donation came from this man Robert Stuart Whipple. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk through just this special exhibition and give you a taster of what's on display, show you some objects, talk a little bit about the history uh, of the museum. We're hoping that this exhibition will now be kept open for an extended period of time, we think through the calendar year 2021, and we're also hoping to reopen to the public relatively soon. We're working towards that, so if you're interested in coming and seeing this exhibition in person, then keep an eye on our social media, and hopefully we'll be able to update you. We don't have a firm date yet, but um, do keep an eye out. So to start the tour, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about the foundation of the museum, and then we'll start moving from case to case and show you some of the things that we put on display. So as I say, the founding bequest was announced in early November of 1944. The backstory was that Robert Stuart Whipple was a local businessman who had his own private collection of scientific instruments and he uh, decided to donate this uh, collection and he offered it to the University of Cambridge. And that was on the condition that they establish a museum for the collection. But also importantly, we have a quote here which is one that we often like to highlight because it gives a taste of the purpose that Whipple intended that museum to serve. And this quote says, this is from the original founding document that was proposed to the university to establish a museum. And the quote says, since Cambridge is preeminent in her tradition of associating teaching with the active prosecution of research, it is important that the museum should be much more than a well-arranged repository of historic scientific apparatus. It should be designed and maintained as a valuable teaching instrument and a cultural accessory to modern research. We like to highlight that in particular because the museum now, as some of you will know, is situated inside the Department of History and Philosophy of Science. And indeed, that department grew around the museum. The museum came first, but that founding desire that people had, that the museum form the nexus of the Centre for Teaching and Research, has been realised by the establishment of the department, which uh, was founded in the 1960s, and has now grown to be one of the leading departments of history and philosophy of science in the world. So, perhaps the best place to start to talk a little bit more about the exhibition is to talk a bit more about Whipple himself. So to do that, we're just going to move over to this case. <clears throat> So this is the one case in the exhibition that does not display objects from Whipple's own personal collection. Rather, what it displays is just a very small proportion of the many objects that we have that were made by the Cambridge Scientific Instrument Company. We have well, well over 500 objects that were produced by this company during its long history. The reason they're in this exhibition is that Robert Stuart Whipple uh, worked for most of his career at the Cambridge Scientific Instrument Company. He joined the company in 1898, when it, 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 the company itself had been founded in 1881, to start producing instruments really to service the growing demand within the University of Cambridge for experimental apparatus. So Whipple joins the company while it's still relatively young, and he rises through the ranks of the company, he proves to be an extremely successful and astute instrument maker and businessman, and he actually rises to become managing director of the company. He himself actually designed some scientific instruments. We have an example here of the Cambridge Whipple temperature indicator, which was a kind of industrial temperature sensor that could detect temperatures across a very large uh, um, temperature range, designed by Whipple himself. 
but he also ultimately proved to be a very good and successful businessman and managing director, and the firm grew massively under his guidance. So by the mid-20th century, it was employing more than 5,000 people within Cambridgeshire, and there were also factories in London and in Ossining, New York. And so it, it really, under his guidance, grew to become a, a, an internationally known maker of scientific instruments. And this made Whipple um, very successful and quite wealthy, and he, during this period, um, began what would prove to be um, uh, a very important uh, hobby for us, and he described it as a hobby when he started it, and that was as a collector. So to understand that, we're going to move over and look at this object, which we've given its own special case. So this is a very important object for us in the museum. It's colloquially called Whipple One, uh, and that's because this is the first object that Robert Stuart Whipple ever bought for his collection. And we have a wonderful quote from him when he um, donated the, his entire collection to the university in 1944. He gave a speech, and in that speech he said, I little thought when I bought an old telescope for the sum of 10 francs from an antique shop in Tours in France in 1913 that I was embarking on the slippery slope of collecting, a slope which leads one to many strange places and has been known to lead to financial disaster. I have been spared the latter trouble and have had much fun. So this um, rather modest looking uh, folding telescope started Whipple on this incredible journey of collecting. And that was in 1913. By 1944, he had more than 1,000 separate instruments in his collection, and with it, uh, a similar number of antiquarian books relating to the history of science, and particularly to the history of scientific instruments. So, one of the ways that we kind of broke up the collection for redisplay and compartmentalized it was one of the first things we sat down and thought was, well, what, what are the real highlights of his collection? So in this case, we gather just some of them. And by highlights, we mean both objects which are particularly exquisite, um, pieces that perhaps he was particularly proud of acquiring, but also pieces that perhaps when he acquired them, he didn't quite uh, necessarily recognize their historical value and importance, or that their historical value has changed over the years. A particularly telling example is this rather modest looking Ptolemaic armillary sphere. So this is a small model of the universe. The wooden ball at the center is the Earth, and the, uh, the bands that surround it, these armillaries, represent the structure of the universe. The thick band that runs around uh, at an angle is the ecliptic, that's the path that the sun takes, and then the other bands uh, define the celestial sphere that surrounds the Earth. Whipple uh, purchased this from a London antique shop in 1928, and he paid quite a modest sum for it. I think he paid something like £12 for it. And he just writes it in his, he kept his own accession register, he just writes in our millinery sphere, £12. A lot of research has been done into this device since, and we now think, we now believe it to be the oldest surviving armillary sphere in the world. So it's a really quite important uh, and rare survival. And it's an example of why the kind of collecting that Whipple did, he was collecting at a time when these kinds of materials were coming on the antique market for quite modest prices. It was so valuable because he collected a very diverse range of materials and some of them have proved to be exceptionally important uh, and rare. Another really fine piece that we can just focus in on here a little bit is this wonderful compass that we've got here. This is a mariner's compass. It's Portuguese, it's dated 1711. These devices are extremely rare. They don't tend to survive because they were made to be used on ships. This particular device was actually used to measure magnetic variation, which is to say the difference between true geographic north and magnetic north, uh, by sighting the sun where the point of sunrise and sunset 
through the side windows, you could actually measure magnetic variation and then your main navigational compass could be reset accordingly. But because these devices are made of wood and paper, they survive in very small numbers. So this is a really kind of uh, wonderful and valuable and important piece for us. And as you can probably see as we move around this case, some of the other pieces are really kind of canonically beautiful, exquisite, fine pieces of uh, craftsmanship. So the next place we're going to move is over here, and we're going to talk about microscopes. And that's because Whipple had a particular interest in collecting microscopes. The Cambridge Instrument Company itself produced a wide range of optical instruments, and Whipple, I think, focused particularly on collecting optical instruments because they were some of the less collected materials in the time period that he's collecting. Uh, Things like sundials, astrolabes, were already be becoming kind of recognized, valued antiques, but things like microscopes are much less so. And one of the things that Whipple wanted to do was to try and collect a kind of historical overview of the development of the microscope. So in this case, 17th and 18th century examples, we've run them chronologically, and they start with really early examples. So we've got 17th century microscopes here. Uh, very early in the history of the microscope. And we then progress through, through the 18th century. And one of the things that Whipple was very interested in showing was the gradual developments and improvements in instruments over time. He, he described this as the evolution of the instrument type. And I think one of the things that he valued was the way in which these kind of material objects were therefore really important source material for understanding improvements and changes in the history of science itself. Because as the techniques uh, of manufacturing microscopes improved and you have transitions and changes in things like the optics so that you begin to develop things like achromatic lenses which give you much better uh, ability to magnify the, um, at very high magnifications, then obviously you begin to see and can study different and new things. So somewhere north of 20% of Whipple's collection is microscopes. Uh, and I think therefore they're a particularly valuable piece of his collection. And this certainly is not all of the microscopes that he collected. We've just only been able to fit in a kind of uh, an overview. Perhaps a little more surprisingly, if we come over here, we have another example of an object that Whipple collected a great many examples of. Um, and these don't typically get displayed, not in history of science museums, and that's spectacles and opera glasses and spy glasses. And I think here Whipple was actually being very canny, very clever, because what he recognized is that these are scientific instruments in so much as in the 17th, in the 18th, in the 19th centuries, the same instrument makers who were making high-end optical devices like telescopes, like microscopes, oftentimes were also making these more common everyday devices. And in fact, this was probably how they made most of their money. Uh, they only got commissions for big telescopes or microscopes relatively infrequently, but they could produce these in quite large numbers. And so Whipple saw them as part of this larger spectrum of the instrument trade. And so he collected them um, in, in large numbers. And to be honest with you, since I've worked in this, this museum um, for more than a decade, we've never had any of these materials on display because a modern display of the history of science doesn't normally have opera glasses in it. So it's really nice to be able to um, go into our stores and get out all of these materials that I think particularly interested, um, and some, some of them I suspect amused uh, with all. We've got things like um, we've got spy glasses here that you wore around your neck as a necklace, for example. And in fact, that idea of instruments and objects that amused uh, and entertained Whipple, we've highlighted a little bit here in this case, where we've tried to draw out some of the more uh, unexpected pieces from Whipple's collection. And by unexpected, we just say the kinds of things that wouldn't typically have been collected in the period collecting, sometimes simply because of geography. So we have, for example, here a Luopan, which is a, uh, often called a geomantic compass. 
uh, mid 19th century from China. But also we've got devices which are really quite quirky. So this, um, what's called an um, umbrella globe, is actually a folding globe. So like an umbrella, it has a mechanism that enables you to um, uh, fold it down so that it can be carried effectively as a stick. If you're a teacher, say, and you're going from uh, class to class or school to school, you can then, uh, what we might say, inflate it, you can open it, and then you've got a, 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 a broadly spherical globe that you can then teach from. Um, a particular highlight um, that we've always enjoyed and have long had on display are these railway spectacles, um, which are here. Um, and these were spectacles designed for early railway travelers, and they included tinted lenses, um, but also eye shields to protect against sunlight, smoke, and sparks. So you can imagine early railway carriages often were actually open. Uh, and so you could buy yourself some railway spectacles. So that's a kind of snapshot of many of the, the diverse things that Whipple collected, and I hope you're starting to get a sense of really um, how wonderfully um, uh, broad his tastes were, and, that, and as a result, how rich his collection is. I'm just going to end by highlighting one of the things that we're very proud of here in the museum, which is the the, the research that has subsequently been performed on Whipple's collection. I think Whipple himself would be very pleased to see that the museum really continues to promote research into objects in the collection. In fact, one of the ob objects that was on display in this case was removed just before lockdown because we had a student who was studying it. And all of the pieces in this case have had articles or books written about them. We've got two books here that the museum published, which are both um, collected volumes of essays, all of which study Whipple Museum objects. Some particular favourite objects in here of mine are things that I have um, studied with colleagues, which is these pieces here, which are um, forgeries. They are fake scientific instruments. Um, they purport to be uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century European instruments, but they were actually made, all of them, uh, we're fairly confident in saying um, uh, in the early 20th century, most of them made in or around uh, Amsterdam. Um, and there's been a lot of research that has grown out of this realisation of um, uh, this, this ring of forgers. So I think I'll end it there. Um, thank you for joining us. As I say, I really hope that you can come and see the museum in person soon. Um, but until then, I hope you've enjoyed my tour. Thank you.